Um, just before he starts, let's take a moment and pray and ask for God to give Paul strength. He has fought the greatest battle the last two days. Uh, the enemy has come every way he could to try to stop him from being in this meeting last night and for sure tonight. So let's just lift our voices and agree together. Heavenly Father, Almighty God, author of eternal life, Father of the only begotten Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, let strength and power come on to your servant. Let the anointing of God come on him. Let him step somewhere adjacent to the stage of life and let clarity and words of knowledge and words of wisdom, signs and wonders and miracles flow into this place to glorify the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. Let him be high and lifted up and the train of the Lord come and fill this place with power and authority in Jesus' name. Amen. Last night was an awesome night for me and I think for many people here. The Lord definitely, clearly, and distinctly revealed to me that he was uh, going to heal cancers and that there'd be a, a large number of people here who were suffering from that malady. And they, uh, there was going to be others here who came from uh, loved ones who were suffering with that deadly disease. And there was a huge, to me, it looked like a, a, a large number of people stood and the power went out. And so I asked the Lord about tonight, and uh, I believe that uh, another of the number one tools of Satan to cripple the church and the body of Christ is uh, diabetes. And uh, uh, I just feel like there's an equal number or more are suffering from diabetic uh, problems, and then you have loved ones that you left behind who, uh, who would appreciate uh, the word being sent to heal them and deliver them from all of uh, their, their uh, diseases. Well, you that uh, have had any problems with, uh, with blood sugar or hypoglycemia, one swing to the other, I want you to stand and you want to represent someone in your family, someone that you love, someone that you, um, you're acquainted with that has uh, uh, diabetes. Would you stand and I want to pray for you and send the word and uh, just look another large number of people representing uh, the fact that you have uh, diabetes and that your friend and loved ones have it. Father, just as sincere as we know how to be, we ask you to send the word, your word, which is forever settled in heaven. And for by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made and all the hosts of them by the breath of your mouth. Oh God, universally, I pray you'll breathe upon every person suffering with this malady and, uh, and uh, show grace and just en engulf and include all other sicknesses and diseases. Send your word and heal those who are not present and bring the power down. Send the power right now, the Pentecost power to heal and deliver people from this serious disease and let them live the rest of their life out uh, in a normal way and enjoy life and living for you, dedicated to you every step of the way. We give you praise now in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, Almighty God, Heavenly Father, in this name of your only begotten Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, we ask it all and we believe the work has begun right now, in Jesus' name, amen. Let's praise him for it. Think of all of the, the sick people in the world today, and, and these are just two of the major uh, uh, sicknesses that are, is taking a, their toll and taking a life, and heart disease, we haven't covered that, and that's a number one issue everywhere we go. Uh, I want to tell you that last night you triggered off something in my spirit that made me know uh, for sure that I'm in the perfect will of God uh, by saying what I've said about uh, Mr. Joseph Blackburn, Satan himself. And I've never uh, been able to handle this before, but for some reason the Lord has um, shown me that this is uh, applicable and this is very uh, serious for this time. So um, 
Uh, and then others uh, said, uh, I received a report from many of you that said uh, you've never heard uh, uh, miracles like this, uh, quite like we talked about last night. Uh, some have never seen them before, never heard of them. And uh, I just consider myself uh, privileged in this sense that I've seen some of the most astounding miracles, shocking and just uh, amazing what God does. And it's all because of um, the price paid by the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, tonight is no exception. We just feel like here, there, and everywhere God is going to be moving by his Holy Spirit. And I want to start out by the most remarkable testimony in my life. It concerns my mother, who was past age uh, to bear a child when I was born. She was 45 years of age and um, had been given up to die by medical authorities in Baylor University Hospital in Dallas, Texas, and told us she had never lived near the time for me to be born. And so both mother and baby was sent home to die. And uh, that's the, the beginning uh, of sorrows for my mother. But up until the time just before um, she was uh, to give birth to me, uh, she had two Pentecostal sisters uh, that came to, uh, to you know, in, in lieu of uh, a doctor being there. They were, uh, what do you call them? Uh, Midwife. Midwives. Midwives, yeah. yes. And they were there to, uh, to help with, uh, uh, with me being delivered. And um, right up until the very time of my birth, my mother was hemorrhaging from tuberculosis in both lungs and a fatal heart disease that was rampant in her body. And uh, uh, as I said, tuberculosis in both of her lungs, hemorrhaging. She couldn't speak hardly above a whisper without uh, causing uh, bleeding and hemorrhaging. And uh, she had three large malignant tumors in her womb diagnosed at Baylor Hospital in, in 1929. I was told that, uh, of course, that, as I said, she would never live near the time for me to be born, so both my mom and I were doomed. And, uh, but at the very last moment, at the midnight hour, the Lord came and showed himself real to my mother and stood as the angel of God by her bedside and said, Daughter, uh, be of good cheer. You will live and not die. And you'll have a, a boy, and his name, you should name Paul. He'll preach my gospel as did the Apostle Paul of old. And believe me, I know of the uh, intensity and the uh, impact uh, that this uh, has made down through the years because I was born for a reason, born for a purpose, and every time I tried to get away from that, uh, I can't explain all of the dangers and the toils and the things that I went through. But my mother was instantly healed. My dad was so... Um, uh, so amazed that she had lived this long and fought this battle so long during the nine months of the pregnancy that he ran across town. We live in a very small community, Garland, Texas, which is a, met uh, which is a metropolis now, I guess, with Dallas, uh, Texas, back-to-back uh, -back city limits. And uh, he ran across town and collected the doctor that uh, had pronounced my mother... Uh, uh, a, a hopeless cancer victim and heart trouble and TB and all that. And so the doctor comes in and he's a member of a church that doesn't believe in miracles and believe that uh, all miracles have passed away. Uh, <clears throat> he uh, looked at my mother and he came running in the house without his, uh, they had, in those days, doctors carried little black bags with their stethoscope and their uh, morphine and uh, everything in it, you know, that it might need. So he came in and forgot to bring that. And he looked at my mom, and my mom was uh, propped up in bed, and she was lifting her arms above her head, which would uh, bring on hemorrhaging. But she was screaming at the top of her voice, praises to God and the glories and hallelujahs in Pentecost form. <clears throat> and, my, uh, and my mother's personal physician said, Mrs. Kane, lie down and save your strength. Don't you know you're dying? And this is where I got my sense of humor, which is better than no sense at all. 
Uh, my mother said, Doctor, uh, I don't need any strength to die. And if I am dying, would you please just let me enjoy myself? <laughs> so she said, the Lord, the Lord stood by my, med, my bedside and told me I'd live and not die. And uh, I'm going to have a baby boy, and I'm naming Paul. I'll name him Paul. He'll preach the gospel as did the apostle of old. And uh, the doctor had quite a hassle with my mother, but finally he left and went out to the car to get his uh, satchel uh, uh, with his uh, paraphernalia in it. And um, when he got back, I was born with a shout, and I've been making a noise ever since. <laughs> Hopefully, uh, it'll be intelligent enough to get a no. And my mother retained that marvelous healing until she was 105 years of age when she went uh, off to glory and no doubt it was received by uh, um, I could only imagine. Praise God. And then um, the, uh, the calling, the election of that time sent me uh, all over the world in my teenage uh, years. And uh, William Branham, who was uh, known as a prophet from America, and probably the most uh, notable prophet uh, in the voice of healing and all of those, uh, all of those concerns. And uh, he and I worked together, uh, had meetings together. And so when he had uh, the angel of the Lord appear to him and told him not to go to um, Switzerland and, and, uh, and Germany, but to send me in his stead because they were planning to arrest him and accuse him of sorcery and black magic and all that, the state churches. And so the angel told him if he sent me, they couldn't hurt me and I could take his place. And so this was a uh, this was a tremendous thing that happened where I was able to speak and preach to 180,000 people in five nights in Karlsruhe, Germany. Meetings were sponsored by, uh, by the mayor of the city and the churches, and it was just absolutely out of this world. Uh, I made some notes, and uh, for some reason I can't read them. So... Uh, Say, what am I supposed to do next, Lord? Please help me here. Oh, well, after uh, we had these great meetings and the things that led up to the great meetings, I should tell you that we went to Los Angeles and uh, the Lord began to uh, reveal things to me about people and I would see visions and tell people to go home and find their loved ones healed. Or uh, one... Um, one afternoon in, uh, in the Paul Reader Tabernacle, which uh, Paul Reader was a man who wrote the song, uh, Only Believe. And he built a great tabernacle in Los Angeles, see thousands of people, and that's where we had the meetings. And uh, I remember one, one night I pointed to a, a couple on the very back row, and uh, I said, you have a baby that was born with polio, and uh, he's uh, in the contagion ward of the hospital right now, but I said, the Lord's going to heal your, your boy, your child in this meeting. And so they go to the hospital and actually kidnap their little boy who uh, had polio from the contagion ward of the hospital. And you can just imagine the trouble they would be in. And so they wrapped him up in blankets, brought him to the meeting, and I saw the whole thing in a vision. I pointed to them again. They're sitting in the same place. And uh, I said, you're a little boy, Jerome. Uh, uh, you, you brought him from the hospital. You took him from the contagion ward. God is going to honor your faith and let him, uh, let him loose. And he walked to the aisle and started walking. One little leg was uh, so much smaller than the other. And before uh, 4,000 or so people, the, many is, could see him from the back row to the front. They could see this little guy walking and that leg increasing to a normal size of the other. Now, maybe you think, maybe you think revival didn't follow that. But one of the greatest soul-saving revivals I've ever had happened right after that. And there were many things like that. There was a Mary Moss story 
uh, a Presbyterian lady who didn't know anything about healing, but she was in the last stages of cancer. And they brought her to the meeting. And when she appeared before me as the Lord would show me names and showed me conditions of the people, I said, your name is Mary Moss. You've been dying for over six years. You have over six cancers in your body, from head to toe, and you've been given up to die. You work for the state uh, health department in Los Angeles, and she was uh, uh, over a, an entire ward in a mental institution uh, in, uh, in the Los Angeles area. And I said, God is going to heal you. Go home, you'll pass all of these tumors. And she went home, and every tumor and every cancer came loose, and she passed them one way or the other from her body. And for many, many years, she would take people to the healing meetings and would uh, help them and feed them and make health food for them. And she was quite uh, an evangelist herself, bringing people to the healing meetings. And so after all the decades passed and this testimony just circled the earth and it was a wonderful uh, power testimony of someone dying of uh, multiple cancers and all. And it was, she passed away and I was so uh, confused and I said, Lord, why did you allow this to happen? I said, here, uh, Mary Moss has, has gone and her testimony with her. And it seemed like the Lord said, well, what did you expect? Uh, she was 100 years old. Well, how long did you want her to live? <laughs> and uh, she was, uh, you know, up uh, past middle age when she was healed. So anyway, God has been so good. And Mary and my mother were ardent friends. And uh, she traveled and brought people to meetings all the time. And uh, this led to me having 100% um, um, access to the mental institutions in, in California. I was never a patient, but uh, uh, even the top uh, psychiatrist, I used to call him the head of the hospital, you know, the head uh, psychiatrist, uh, he gave me full run of the hospital. I'd go anywhere and pray for anybody, and uh, I just can't forget the uh, opportunities that, that opened up for me because of the healing power of God. And then another meeting in Los Angeles, we were at the old Pisgah Tabernacle, which was an historic place. And uh, I'd been preaching for several weeks, and they were, uh, they were uh, moving the meeting to a campgrounds where we'd have a huge number, a large number of people. And so I had a vision that uh, there were just uh, hundreds and hundreds, just a huge crowd of uh, Asian people there, and of Koreans, uh, it turned out to be. And so I had my assistant read, uh, call Dr. Smith, the uh, pastor, and I said, ask him if there's going to be uh, any uh, Asian people in the meeting because of the dream I had. And so he said, well, no, I, I don't think. He said, well, we always have, it. you know, maybe a Chinese person from Los Angeles, uh, uh, two or three like that, but no, there's no major number of Asian people uh, signed up for this, for this camp meeting. And so that really troubled me because the vision was just as clear as any other vision I had that came to pass. And so the day uh, of the meeting, we arrived, and uh, hundreds of Korean people were on the uh, campgrounds expecting to use the auditorium. And the meeting had been double booked with the old Pisgah uh, conference or camp meeting people and the uh, Presbyterian uh, Korean uh, group. And that was a fulfillment of the vision. So we decided to get as many of both our parties and, and the Korean people in the building. And it was uh, one sight to behold, people just uh, crowding all around that building. And I told the story about the angel appearing to my mother and telling her to be of good cheer, she'd live and not die. And the fruit of her womb is a male child to be born and preach the gospel, etc. And so when I told that, it was the first time the angel that appeared to my mother, I believe it was the Lord Jesus, he appeared in that building over to the right. And these Asian people trampled each other to get to him. It was so real and so vivid, 
uh, and, and they actually stepped on each other and tramped on each other to get to this angel to touch him. And so that opened the door to the Presbyterian uh, Korean ministry. And then that meeting went from there to the Korean groups all over Los Angeles. It's marvelous and wonderful, and I've never uh, been able to imagine. Uh, like I said, I can only imagine what God really did behind the scenes that we've never heard about yet, but just the things that we've heard about could blow your mind, just, could just send you uh, into a, a praise uh, to God, to God Almighty. So Mary Moss was gloriously healed, and then followed that was the uh, Korean experience for the angel that appeared to my mother, the Lord Jesus, I believe, appeared in that uh, campgrounds above Los Angeles in the mountains. And it was just absolutely uh, amazing. And so, um, uh, oh, um, so in one of the meetings where William Branham sent me to Stuttgart, Germany, which is, uh, I believe, the birthplace of um, uh, Oh, our German brother, um, uh, who Reinhard. has millions Reinhard. of people. Who? Reinhard, Reinhard Bonnke. Uh, Dr. Reinhard Bonnke has preached to more people and led more people to Christ than Billy Graham or anyone in the whole world. And uh, I think his father was one of the pastors. And uh, Dr. Bonnke, Reinhard Bonnke, was just a, a little boy, was in that meeting. And I didn't know that he was in that meeting until many years later we stood together on a uh, was to get it on a platform at a conference. And he looked at me and said, I know more about you than you know about me. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, I was in your meeting when I was just a little boy and my dad was um, a pastor in, in uh, uh, Stuttgart, Germany. Well, during that time, uh, in 1957, William Branham sent me to these meetings in Germany Women uh, all over Germany had huge goiters, growths, like tumors on, on their necks, some of them double goiters. And uh, there's one woman who had a, a, a goiter as big as a, a cantaloupe, or a, it, was a, it was absolutely huge. And uh, there was a, a childlike faith in me in those days that I felt I could say the most uh, uh, ridiculous things, the things that weren't apt to happen. They weren't and just, you know, like in five minutes, this is going to happen or this is going to happen. And so I looked at this woman. I said, you're not going to have that uh, goiter. And within five minutes from now, that's going to disappear or I'm a false prophet. I couldn't believe I said that. And here the crowd, you know, is waiting, just ready to hang me if it didn't happen. And uh, so I, I laid hands on her and prayed for her. And touched the gorder and it melted. Just uh, all she had was just a horrible, uh, you see, I've got several chins down here, but this was so huge, just this empty piece of uh, skin and flab that I would slap it and go from one side of her face to the other. It was absolutely horrible. <laughs> and uh, it turned out to be the most glorious thing. God healed people. And uh, there was a policeman in the meeting that was uh, happened to be a prophetic person and I pointed to him and I said, sir, you have a prophetic gift, but you have been uh, ostracized or turned out of your church because they thought your gift was of, of, of the uh, dark side. And it isn't. Your gift is from God. And you know, uh, the church pastor and the people that were members of that church fell on their face and wept and uh, confessed to God that they had mistreated this brother. And just brotherly love and uh, the power of love came over all that meeting, and it was the most glorious experience. So uh, I'm just trying to think of the things that Danny, uh, my assistant, uh, uh, remembered and wanted me to tell about. And uh, I've just told you about the Korean angel. I got ahead of myself there. Now we're right back to Mr. Joseph Blackburn, the devil himself. I've never had an experience like that before nor since. But uh, I was uh, planning on building a church in Los Angeles, and some people had uh, secured one of the most uh, beautiful auditoriums called the World Theater, or the Markel Theater at that time. 
and uh, we were having a, a huge crowd one night, and a man walked in the building as the offering was being taken. And uh, in those days, some of us took our own offerings. I can't believe that happened, but it did. And so uh, this man walked in, walked all the way up to the front, and there were no seats available, but there was one seat uh, to my left on the front row. And this man came down the aisle and sat in that seat. And he looked, uh, I don't think I would ever describe a man as being beautiful, but he was the most handsome man I've ever seen in my life. And he looked like a movie star without makeup, without needing makeup. And he had a tuxedo on, and he was dressed fit to kill, as they say. And um, so I was uh, trying to sit down, I was taking the offering, and, I, and so after the offering place were being passed, he motioned me to come to the edge of the platform like this, and I knelt down, and he came up, and I thought uh, uh, that his, the light and the glow on this man and the, and the uh, beautiful features or the handsome features of his face looked like uh, on a wedding cake. The groom just stepped off of the top of the wedding cake, and here he was, uh, the most handsome person I've ever seen in my life, and just a, a light, a glow. And um, he said, Mr. Kane, I'm, uh, I'm glad he didn't say brother. Uh, Mr. Kane, <laughs> I am sent from the source, and I have a, a message for you. Could I have an audience with you after the meeting tonight? And so I was totally mesmerized with this man. And I said, well, sure, after the meeting, we'll go up to my office. And uh, uh, so we did. I couldn't hardly wait till the meeting was over because he just... Uh, my attention was focused on him. He just seemed like I was preaching that night a message of all messages on Jesus, the light of the world. And the first thing he said when, we, when he was seated uh, upstairs in the office, he looked at me and he said, uh, Mr. Kane, if you can believe, I am the light of the world, just like you preach tonight. And I'm telling you, looking at him and the glow about him, I was... Everything he said was so loving and Christ-like, and he named the childhood sins, the little boy sins that I committed, and I thought were awful, you know. And uh, but he said, you know, I only chuckled when you were in that little red uh, wagon, and the name of it, he uh, he revealed the name of it, and he said, uh, and the wheel came off, and you kicked it, and you um, said, uh, you know, he told me the word I said. Only grown-ups would use in those days. And um, he said, do you realize how much I loved you? He said, I just loved you. That wasn't, uh, uh, there wasn't anything wrong with that. So you're just covering all my sins, you know. And then he increased in, uh, in the... Uh, uh, in the way uh, he was manifested till I, I thought... If I miss this, and this is my, uh, my only opportunity, you know, to respond, if I miss my day of grace, and I miss this day, and this is Jesus, then what am I going to do in the day of judgment? So I almost fell on my knees to worship him because it was that real. And um, so... Uh, uh, as he continued uh, to uh, say things, he had already said, you know, if you can believe, I am that light, the light of the world you preached about. And um, so he told me that uh, he was going to make me, if I would listen to him, he was going to make me the most famous preacher in the world and the wealthiest uh, preacher in the world, and that uh, he would be able to, to procure or, or, or purchased that building for me, and we'd call it uh, uh, Hollywood Temple, and it would appeal to the Jewish population and, and the movie stars, and said, they'll come and fall at your feet, and um, you'll be the most uh, uh, well-known pr uh, preacher in the world. All you have to do is just let me instruct you and tell you uh, what to do. And I never thought of this in this light until uh, the other night, uh, when I began to reminisce about uh, this uh, appearance of the enemy of the devil, I never thought that 
Mr. Joseph Blackburn, who's, that's who he said he was, who was the devil himself, he wasn't an angel of light, he was a devil. And believe me, I lived in fear for a year or two after that. I couldn't sleep in a room without the light was on. It was, and when I came down from, um, well, let me, I'm getting ahead of my story. I never was a good storyteller. But when, um, when I heard him saying, you know, that uh, trying to get me to worship him and trying to get me to, to agree that he would, um, uh, he would just map out the course of my, the rest of my life, make me the most famous and wealthiest person in the ministry. When I came downstairs, my mother, who had more discernment than anybody I've ever known, she said, son, do you realize that you were set up all that time uh, with the devil himself? She said, we were down here on our faces praying that he would not uh, destroy you. And uh, here uh, he manifested uh, such glory and such uh, it's unbelievable my mother had unbelievable discernment, too. And so anyway, after that, uh, we did the research. We had people do research to see if they could find someone named Joseph Blackburn, which he said was, he was from Pasadena, California, which also had some significance. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, so uh, I was traveling alone in those days, and... Uh, uh, I was afraid that to look in my rearview mirror in the car, I was afraid he would appear in the back seat. I was afraid he'd appear, appear in the front seat with me. And my life was just uh, uh, tainted with fear. And like I say, I'd leave the light on. Everywhere I'd go, I'd leave the light on all night. But one night, I was driving all night to get from Midland, Odessa, Texas, uh, to my home in Garland, Texas. And... Um, uh, I found a, uh, I couldn't, uh, couldn't find a motel to, to stop at everything, so no vacancy, no vacancy. And so I saw a real nice looking place, I pulled off the road and it was a beautiful uh, colonial type building. And uh, I thought, well, it's just a perfect place for me to rest and then I'll drive on. And so when I lowered the seat, uh, I was driving on Lincoln in those days, and uh, uh, I uh, looked in the mirror and I thought, Lord, please don't let him appear. Don't let him appear with me while I'm alone ever again. And so when I got in a restful position, I looked in this beautiful colonial building, had a sign across it, and it read, Blackburn Mortuary. Well, I want you to know that it went through my body like liquid fire. And I, I, I don't think anyone realized how fast you can start a Lincoln Continental. <laughs> but I started that thing up and the seat was still in a reclining position. I was holding on to the wheel, driving uh, as fast as I could uh, to get home. I drove all night long and uh, by the time I got to Fort Worth, Texas, I was ready to collapse and I was trying to get a, a hotel or a motel rather to give me a room. And they said, no, we don't rent rooms at this time of the morning. You know. I said, well, uh, I think I'm having a heart attack and I need to, uh, I've had an experience that has taken me out and please let me have a room. So they did. But I lived in fear. And I went to, uh, for a meeting right away in uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota at the uh, Minneapolis Evangelistic Auditorium, which was a church where Tammy Faye and uh, Jim Baker were teenagers, unmarried, but they were teenagers before they uh, before they were married. And the pastor married a very famous uh, uh, woman. She's older than me, but I was in love with her as, when I was a young uh, boy, and she was uh, the most wonderful lady preacher in the world. And uh, so she noticed that I was sleeping with a light on every night, and she said, why do you, why do you uh, stay in your room with that light on all the time? And I told her the story, and so they prayed and prayed, and but things didn't get any better. I still didn't want to see Mr. Blackburn ever again. And uh, so that was the story. And then yesterday, or the day before, I began to think, you know, there, there's, a, uh, there's a mega church here and there that takes in millions, one takes in hundreds of millions of dollars a year, 
And I'm wondering, did Mr. Blackburn, as the devil himself, appear and offer the same thing to them he offered to me? And it's very uh, plausible it could happen because these churches are preaching uh, a gospel without uh, the shedding of blood. There's no remission of sins. They don't preach that. They just think, uh, God's not mad at you. Whatever you've done, whoever you did it with, God is not mad at you. And just taking, taking them off the hook, no need for repentance, no need for the cross, no need for the shedding of the blood of Jesus Christ. And it just shook me from my very foundations to think that someone is here in England that may be under that spell. We have someone in the United States that may be under that spell. The William Branham followers who are in deep depression, uh, deep uh, um, uh, de deception, uh, they take in $200 million a year to support the second return, the second coming of William Branham. The enemy, Mr. Blackburn, is out to deceive the whole uh, world, if it were possible. He's out to deceive you as an individual. He's out to deceive your children. He's out to deceive your mate, your loved ones. And we must realize that the, the gospel is being preached without the blood of Christ, without uh, the cross, is no gospel at all. And we need to know that uh, any time you're listening to a very successful person, who made them a success? Was it really God? Was it really the Bible themes for prosperity? Or was it something to, to uh, repaint the gospel, or republish the gospel, or, or do the gospel in a way that would not bring glory and honor and praise and significance to the Lord Jesus Christ? I want you to know that it's most important that we make the Lord Jesus Christ our Savior. It's most important that we tell God who he is. He doesn't need to know who he is. He already knows it. But he needs to know that we know who he is. And he's, he's sovereign redeemer. He's sovereign God. He's almighty God. He's the father of the Lord Jesus Christ, his only begotten son. And he is here today to heal and to save and deliver and to bring your... Every one of your loved ones, he has made provision for you and for me to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, for us to be saved, and then for our house to be saved. Our entire house is under that covering and covered by the blood of Jesus and by the promise that if we believe and we come to Christ and we believe with all of our hearts, we believe in the cross, we believe in the shed blood of Jesus for the propitiation of our sins, then all of our loved ones, all of our children, and all of your children's children are under this. You shall be saved and your house. Glory to God. You shall be saved and your house. But what kind of a gospel, what kind of a salvation is it for people to uh, support ministries that do not preach and do not preach the importance of the cross and the fundamentals of the gospel, which are so important? And here we have those churches, those mega churches, which are thriving and they're filled. One of those churches has asked recently, why do you never, why do you never speak about uh, same-sex marriage? They answered, we do not speak against it because Jesus himself did not speak against it, which was a ridiculous answer. Jesus Christ, though a man of mercy and grace and all of that, was still uh, in the same uh, had the same focus as God the Father who couldn't stand to look upon sin and who, uh, uh, who punishes uh, sinners. And we had the great reformation and all the sinners in the hands of an angry God. They were uh, like shaking people over hell on the end of a rotten stick. And uh, uh, we need that conviction and that power to come back. And there are a million miles from it in many mega churches in America and uh, you have a man here in the UK who is uh, as uh, much a deceiver as, uh, as Joseph Blackburn himself, Mr. Satan himself. And, uh, and the power of the gay community, uh, some of them are not rich people, but some of them are the wealthiest people in the world. There was a young man who was... Uh, disillusioned with the Pentecostal church in Dallas, Texas, and 
They put him out of the church because of his gay lifestyle. <clears throat> and he was so possessed and so damaged that he, he had the physique of a, a sports uh, a football star or a soccer uh, <coughs> excuse me, player. And he was willing to have his body reshaped uh, and bone structures changed to make him look like uh, uh, more like a woman. And his, his ambition was to come back to that same church that had um, ostracized him and uh, pay them back for what they had done to him. And he had a man who was willing to put up the money for this uh, humongous amount of surgery. And, and it's the most deceitful and one of the most... Uh, well, it is not of God. And I'm, if anyone is in that trap, just remember it's one of the number one things. Uh, perversion is uh, uh, it's an invention of the devil himself, the perversion of satanic power. Father, I pray that you'll just loose and release anyone that's under this kind of a spell and under this kind of deception. And Lord, those that are leading this deceptive race, I pray you'll convict them and bring them to a saving knowledge of you. And Lord, bring the church back to establish us uh, as it was on the day of Pentecost when the first church was born. Lord, let us have a rebirth of what happened at Pentecost Day. Just baptize us afresh for the baptism of power, of love, and of a sound mind, and deliver people that are uh, deceived and bound by any spirit of deception whether it be sexual or whether it be uh, any other sin, Lord, from major sin to the least. I pray from the least to the greatest sins that will be released from those today and be uh, willing to be covered by the shed blood of Jesus Christ, which washes away all sin. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, uh, I really don't know the... The reason why the Lord would have me to do this the first time I've done this before, but I do believe with all my heart that uh, Mr. Joseph Blackburn, who was the devil himself, and I want to make it very clear, he was not an angel of light. He was not transformed into some uh, angel of light. He was the devil. And I want you to know that I wouldn't, uh, with my uh, experiences with the Lord, I wouldn't dare fall for such deception and for such uh, coming under the control of the auspices of the uh, of an of a angel of light. He was a devil, and I know it. And I know that he's appeared to others, and there, there's damnable doctrines, satanic doctrines being taught, and millions of dollars being brought in. And I told you, even with the William Branham, William Branham was the greatest prophet in my estimation that ever lived in our day, in our time. And yet, his followers, after he was, de uh, after he, um, uh, they, they made him a, a deity and all that, and even an equal with Christ. They are in total deception. And that organization, I saw a tax return from them for one year, and there was almost $200 million for a year. And these are people that do nothing but gather together and listen to a tape of William Branham's voice because they have um, deified him as... Uh, uh, as above the Lord Jesus Christ. They're waiting for his second return, not the Lord Jesus. And what a, what a terrible, terrible tragedy that is. They, we were together. Uh, there are 1,700 messages published on uh, recordings and CDs and all that William Branham preached. And a great number of those messages, I was a part of the ministry that, uh, where we teamed up for a meeting. And uh, they have um, deleted and uh, edited so many of those things that were awesome, like Brother Branham telling about my calling. And he uh, said that my mother had the greatest testimony of anyone in the 20th century of her healing and all as far as he was concerned. And they took away all of his um, humility and all of uh, the things that were ascribed to him until... At the last, it seemed as though he was uh, falling into the deception himself. But I want you to know how fortunate I feel that I didn't swallow the, the lies and, the, uh, and fall for the uh, offer that Satan made to me. And I know that something could have happened. 
I've certainly never regretted one day of my life or one minute or one second of my life that I didn't uh, fall and worship him as he uh, appeared to be the light of the world in my presence. Oh, God, may every person here in the UK, Lord, may they realize that there's a real devil, there's a real hell to shun, there's a real devil to resist. And Lord, I pray that those who are under the cloud of deception will be removed, that will be, they'll be removed and separated from that in Jesus' name today. In Jesus' name. Danny, I want you to come and see if I've missed any of these points that I wanted to bring out. Um, uh, oh, thank you. Yeah, Paul, I think, uh, I don't know if you, uh, maybe I didn't hear you, but one part of your mom's testimony was the most awesome thing. She had both breasts completely eaten with cancer. And he was literally nursed just weeks after that on breast that had been completely yeah, eaten, totally restored, totally restored yeah. and completely miraculously recreated. She went back to Baylor University Hospital and they, re, uh, they announced her and proclaimed her a miracle woman. They said only Almighty God and his Christ can create breast tissue. Think about yeah. that. Breast tissue that was hemorrhaging bleeding, just a mass of wounds and sores within a matter of weeks is completely healed and recreated and able to nurse him to health. Mm. And then, Paul, mm -hmm. you were going to talk about um, uh, Jesus in the wilderness. Oh, yes. You know, it is written. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in, um, in the Gospels, uh, the devil taking Jesus, Luke 4, I believe it is, one of, the, one of the references to the devil in the days of temptations when uh, he took him up into the high mountain and, and uh, the, the devil said, all of this, uh, if you bow down and worship me, I'll give you all of this, the kingdoms of the world, and all of that. And this is so close to what Joseph Blackburn as the devil himself has promised. And... Um, uh, if the devil can just get any worship from you or any recognition from you or just get any leeway to come into your life, he'll take uh, uh, the inch you give him and, and uh, control you by miles. But uh, the devil is very real. But we're here to glorify God Almighty and his Christ. And um, uh, this marvelous testimony of my mother, Dr. Lucas, uh, uh, the best-known cancer specialist, as much as they knew about cancer in 1929, was at Baylor University Hospital. He was from your hometown, St. Louis, Missouri. Yes, and he told my mother that she was healed by the power of God, that no, uh, no one had had tissue recreated outside of the Creator himself, and that I was raised on this very breast that my mother... My mother was made ever with whole, and lived a supernatural life for uh, until she was 105 and, and, and taken tell, to glory. Tell, tell about you. Uh, there was a, a time when the devil uh, began to, he, he changed his appearance and he became more so and like Jesus. And then he talked about uh, you kicking the wagon. And then that came to you about Pentecost and the Pentecostals of how they believed and uh, how you challenged him and what oh, shut yes. the whole thing down. Yeah, the thing that, uh, that happened at the very end of uh, uh, that visit Satan, uh, between Satan and I, uh, I was out from under that spell just enough to remember the Pentecost was using uh, uh, this phrase, every spirit that uh, confesses not that Jesus came in the flesh is not of God. And I thought, well, uh, I'm going to try it. And with all of my might, I hit my desk with both fists, and I said, do you confess that Jesus Christ came in the flesh? And he was just completely bewildered. And he said, well, that's totally irrelevant. I don't, I said, what do you mean by that? I don't know what you're talking about. I said, do you confess that Jesus Christ came in the flesh? And I said, don't, I, you've lost me. I said, sir, this... Uh, this, uh, the audience is over. You, I have no more time for you. And then when I got downstairs, my mother grabbed me and embraced me and said, son, you were 
there with the devil all those uh, all that time, and it was absolutely amazing. Tell about where he stepped out into the street and the oh, bus yes. he was going to take. Well, he said uh, when he turned into a normal human being, as normal as could be, he said, uh, "You know, uh, I just have time to make the connection with the last bus with connection to to Pasadena, California." I said, Mr. Kane, when you pray, would you remember Joseph Blackburn in Pasadena? I'm having domestic trouble. And you know, he transformed himself right into an ordinary person. But when he uh, walked out of the Markel World Theater building, uh, the, a half, less than a half block is uh, Gower Street. And then a few more blocks is Hollywood and Vine, the crossroads of the world. And we're going to have this for our headquarters. And, uh, so Mr. Blackburn stepped off of the curb, and the bus is approaching, and it was just uh, unusually well lit, and it was just like you're in a trance or in another world. And all of us stood out in front and watched him step off of the curb. When he got to the very middle of the uh, of Hollywood Boulevard, he just vanished, vanished, and the, uh, the bus waiting for him to get on, they, they took off and left him. And uh, I've never forgotten Mr. Blackburn, and I have no, no desire to ever see him again. And uh, I don't sleep with a light on anymore because Jesus is the light of the world. And so Amen. Just, Amen. Jesus is the Amen. light of the world. Yeah. The light of the world. You want, you want to, Can you think of anything else well, I plan to I, say? I wish you'd talk just a minute or two about your mom and uh, her discernment. And, you know, before a meeting, she would, she would sometimes, the Lord... Oh, my... Uh, you know, sometimes the gifts of the Spirit and ministries run in families, uh, and sometimes it, it doesn't happen. But uh, with my mother, uh, she had the, the most keen sense of discernment and revelation that I've ever witnessed, and she traveled with me. And she was, uh, you know, I thought, well, if Russia ever finds out about my, uh, my mother and uh, the secret of the Lord with her, they're going to beat a path to our door. But my mother was able to tune in on a meeting and she'd stay in the motor home in those days and pray for me as I would go out. And she'd take my hand and said, Lord, bless your servant and my son and make him just as little as he can be so that you can become as big as you can be. And she prayed that prayer for me every time I would leave and every time I would go to a meeting. So one night in West Los Angeles at the Full Gospel Tabernacle and Assemblies of God Church, where uh, some very uh, well-known uh, ministers, pastors, I, if, you, if I call their names, you'd remember some of them, some of you here. And um, uh, let's, oh, and I would leave the, the, the uh, motor home and mom would pray for me and said, son, don't forget the lady to your right, your extreme right in the wheelchair and a blue dress. This is her night to be healed. And boy, as soon as I'd get in that building, that lady would definitely be there to my right in that wheelchair, and she walked before the meeting was over and, and uh, uh, pushed her wheelchair out and saw somebody pushing her in the wheelchair, and uh, it was healed. Then she, one night she said, don't forget, there's a man going to be there, a boy, and he has cancer of the tongue, and the Lord's going to save him and heal him. And so I couldn't, that was one, I just couldn't find anybody to fit that description in an audience about this size, and he just wasn't to be found. And then all of a sudden, the Lord gave me a vision of a lady, a young lady, and I said, this is your birthday. And she said, yes, sir. And I said, uh, God has a wonderful birthday present for you. Your um, fiance uh, has cancer of the tongue, and that boy was with her, you know, and he shot up out of his chair, and his tongue was white as snow. And uh, he came running down the aisle, and by the time he got to the front of the meeting, his color had changed, his tongue had become normal, and he was speaking in tongues, uh, filled with the Holy Ghost, saved, filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to preach. So he was uh, preaching a little five-minute message before it was over with. Amen. So that was wonderful. And then one, one of the... One of the greatest uh, visions I had of my own, I was studying with a uh, pastor of um, Full Gospel Tabernacle in West Los Angeles, and Reed Grafke, my assistant, we were on the, both uh, up in the day, we were on the platform praying for the meeting that night. And I said, you know, Dr. Uh, uh, Smith, the pastor, I said, you, uh, you won't believe this, but I had a, a dream and a vision of a man 
like death warmed over. He looked like he was about over six feet tall, maybe seven feet tall, the tallest man I've ever seen. And two men are on each side of him. They're pulling him down the aisle. And he's sitting on the front row, the second row from the front here on the left. And the Lord, the angel of the Lord told me he was going to reveal that man's name to me. And having never met the man and he knew nothing uh, about me or I didn't know anything about him personally, the, the angel said, when you, uh, when you tell him his name, uh, it's going to be like alternating current shocking his body, going all through. It just gave shock treatment an entirely new meaning to me. And he's going to be instantly healed. He only has 24 hours to live in the last stages of leukemia. They brought him from the hospital this meeting. And so uh, he said, well, that's awesome. We can't only wait for that to happen. And that night, uh, there was that one seat, or three seats, rather, uh, on the second row to my left. And for some reason, the place was packed, but those three seats were available. And so uh, just before I was introduced, they, uh, these two men uh, carrying him, uh, lifting him up, dragging him down the aisle and set him in that seat, this uh, horrible cancer victim. And um, then I said, oh, this is going to be wonderful. I couldn't hardly get through my message. I really uh, put my message in fast forward. And, uh, I wanted to see this healing more than anything. And so finally I finished the message. I looked to him as the first one to pray for him. And I said, sir, the angel of the Lord told me that when I called your name, having never met you, you know nothing about me, and we've never had any exchange of any kind between us, it's going to shock your system. It's going to be like alternating electric current going through your body, and you're going to be healed of leukemia. You're in the last stage of leukemia. The doctor's I've only given you 24 hours to live, and they drug you into this meeting. You're going to be instantly healed. And I want you to know it was a drama of my life. I said, oh, Lord, what is his name? What is his name, you know? And uh, the angel of the Lord was a friendly angel in those days, and he whispered in my ear, and he said, you know. I said, no, I don't know. I really don't know. Please help me. This is the most embarrassing moment of my life. I said, your name is, and it wouldn't come to me. And he said, you know, you know. And then I said, oh, I don't know, I don't know. And I was about to have a nervous breakdown. And I looked and there was like a, a, like a neon sign, a, a sign, above the, a sign above that clock there. And neon letters said UNO. And I said, UNO? He said, you know, that's my name, you know Ferguson, yeah. And uh, he was instantly healed. And so that man gained supernatural strength almost instantly. It was able to walk on his own, able to jog. Before the week was over, he was jogging four miles every day. Amen. I was in perfect Hallelujah. health. Hallelujah. God healed him. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Do it again. And um, he lived for many years, and uh, I couldn't imagine why he had to die because it was such a wonderful miracle like Mary Moss, 100 years old. I, how old did you, uh, how long did you want her to live, you know? Well, I wanted him to live. It was a wonderful testimony and a wonderful blessing to everyone who heard it. But he, um, his wife went on to be with the Lord. He was up in years then. And so many years later, he uh, passed on in perfect health, except, uh, you know, we're, uh, we're uh, no, no disease is going to take us and no sickness will ever take us except our last sickness, I guess. Uh, if we don't get healed, that will transfer us to glory. But he lived a supernatural life. And all these things, I just give God all the glory and all the praise Amen. and all the recognition yeah. and all the honor from that day to this. And from the rest of my life, I magnify him and I glorify him and I adore him. You know, um, uh, Christ uh, on that cross, we should adore him. We should honor him and praise him for what the price, the supreme price that he paid shedding his blood, his life's blood for the remission of our sins and never accept anything below that wonderful um, act of the love of God which passes all understanding. Amen. Is that about... I think let's pray the impartation prayer for the people. Yeah. Uh, when my mom passed away at 105, uh, Mike Bickle, who uh, is the head of the House of Prayer in Kansas City and 
one of the largest uh, movements, uh, prayer movements in the world today. He was there with me. John Wimber and his wife had come to pray for my mother and they had gone back home. And, but John and uh, the nurse that stayed with us and her husband, uh, when, when uh, Mike Bickle and I were standing at my mom's bedside, uh, there was a, uh, a large clot uh, about, about this large that the nurses used to check my mother's respiration and her vital sign. And so when she drew her last breath in the presence of uh, people in the, in, the, in the room and uh, Mike Bickle and I standing at her bedside, Mike said, look, Paul, look at the clock. And I looked and it was exactly 4.18 a.m. in the morning on the fourth month, the 18th day, of, of uh, uh, April, yeah. was it April? April. And then the scripture the Lord gave me, uh, the Lord gave me through my mom as a promise that she would give me a scripture that would sum up all that I was uh, called to do in my last in the in my lifetime. It was a scripture from uh, Luke four eighteen. All coalies all brought together at that one great moment, and uh, that. The Lord has shown me should be uh, uh, imparted to the the people everywhere I go, like you folks here today, you wonderful people. The Lord has given me the privilege of an impartation to pass on to you the good things He's done for me and the wonderful uh, gifts that He has uh, produced at the, all at the right time, the right place for the perfect situations. So, uh, now in the winter of my life, so it seems, I'm going everywhere and doing this impartation, praying that everything God has ever revealed to me, everything he's ever done for me, will in some part be uh, transferred to you, uh, like uh, impartation of the Holy Spirit's gifts. And I hope you won't take this uh, with anything but total sincerity and, and total awe and, 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 um, and, and love for this to happen. But the Lord wants to make all of his people, you know, would to God all the Lord's people were prophets. Would to God that all of God's people would prophesy. Would to God that all of God's people would be uh, healers and would heal the sick in the name of Jesus and all that. So I'm going to do my best just in a simple way to impart to every one of you. It's the greatest thing I could ever do for our friends in the UK and you're here from other places, to impart to you uh, what God has imparted to my mother, what he imparted to me in these supernatural lifestyles for all these years. Now, I don't brag about it, but I've been called after um, uh, being engaged more than once and wanting to be married, wanting to, and I don't know a normal man, that gets married, but what he wants to recreate himself, he wants to have a son, at least, and children, and um, and God bless sons and daughters. But uh, I, I wanted to be married, and then the Lord called me to celibacy at a time when I was engaged to an Assemblies of God official daughter, and the superintendent of the Assemblies of God was going to perform this ceremony. The angel of the Lord appeared to me and said, if you really want to walk with God that you say you, you want, he wants you to know, he sent me to tell you that he walked alone. And here I got a call to celibacy right in the middle of my engagement with the pictures and the announcements, a uh, quarter page of the newspaper. And oh, you don't know the, the trouble that I've seen having to call off an engagement like that. But I want you to know there's a price to pay for every ministry. There's a price of celibacy that I've paid for that. I don't boast about it, I don't brag about it, I don't consider myself elevated above anybody, but I have been a celibate all my life and it's been painful, it's been uh, mourningful, it's been mournful really because I wanted the love of a wife, I wanted the love of children, and that's the sacrifice one, only one sacrifice that I've made, and you may be called a, uh, another type of sacrifice, but whatever it takes, give it all to Jesus Christ and follow Amen. the path of the lone Galilean. His voice that subdued the rough billows is going to be heard. 
is going to be heard tonight, not just in Judea no more. It's going to be heard tonight. Father, I pray right now. Let's just stand. As sincere, just as, I, as sincere as I know how to be, everyone standing here on the lower floor, in the balcony, in the overflow auditorium, I pray, Lord, that you will cause suddenly to come upon them this abundance of power and this anointing and this transference and this uh, uh, anointing that you've uh, given me will be given them and the anointing you've given others, Lord. I pray that you will help me, help me as I pronounce this upon them and uh, give me the anointing and the ability just to say it right. May you impart to them the best of the gifts of the Spirit, the ones that need that is needed the most will come into operation in their lives. And they'll say to the righteous, it shall be well with them. They'll say to the crippled and the sick and the afflicted, rise and walk in the name of Jesus, or go in the call, uh, street call straight, or go to this street and you'll find someone in this apartment or in this home that's crippled in a wheelchair and there is their time to walk, their time to be healed. Lord, let this anointing be upon every individual that's sincere and every person, every follower of yours, every follower, every ardent follower of the Lord Jesus Christ that's in the building, anywhere in this building, the sound of my voice, I pray you will baptize them with this real sense of values, with this real anointing from the real Jesus, from the real Christ, the only begotten Son of Almighty God. Lord, I pray that you will baptize them and use them in a way that people will look to them and say, we've never seen it on this fashion before. But they will say, surely God is in that brother. God is in that sister. God is in that pastor. God is in that church because the secrets of my heart has been made manifest. And I know God has made himself real to me here tonight. And thank you for it, Lord. In Jesus' name. Baptize everyone with your Holy Spirit, with the Holy Ghost, and with fire, with tongues and interpretation of tongues, with a word of knowledge, with the words of wisdom. I pray, Lord, that the healing miracles will come upon each of them, and they will be evangelists, and they will win the loss to Christ, and they will have the power and the gift of evangelism and the gift of witnessing. Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord. Make them your witnesses, Lord, and make us to a stole your name. Make us uh, to where we can make your name real to the heathen. Make your, real, your name real to those who think they know it all. Lord, show them, for we, kn we know nothing at all as we ought to know it until you appear and show yourself real. Lord, in your sovereignty and your righteousness and your justice, your love, your eternal life, your omnipotence, your omniscience, your omnipresence, your veracity, oh God, show yourself real to everyone with every one of your gifts of the Holy Ghost. Send them with fire and clarity. Now, in the name of Jesus, amen, amen. Worship him with all of your spirit. Now is the day of salvation. Now is the day of impartation. Receive, this is the greatest day of our lives. On this day at Kensington Temple, God has made his mark on your life and upon mine. Let's praise him for it. In Jesus' name. Amen.